So hi everyone, my name is Jessica. I'm one of the clinical hemoc pharmacists here. I'm going to be starting the day off talking about anti-metabolites. So our objectives for today will explain the mechanisms of action, indications, and side effects of anti-metabolites, and then we'll also talk about supportive care management for these agents. Um, so anti-metabolites interfere with the synthesis of DNA and sometimes RNA. Um, and certain metabolites actually interfere with the enzymes that are involved in DNA metabolism. Um, however, most anti-metabolites mimic nucleotides and either interfere with the polymerase reaction or get incorporated into DNA. Um, and that subsequently creates a misread codon or interferes with later replication. All anti-metabolites require that the target cell be in the growth cycle um, and often are used in combination with other agents. So there are four different categories of anti-metabolites and we will discuss each of these today. Um, this includes folic acid analogs, purine analogs, pyrimidine analogs, and hypomethylating agents. So starting off with our folic acid analogs, this includes methotrexate, pemetrexate, and pralotrexate. Um, so a little history on methotrexate. Um, folic acid was administered and found to be associated with a worsening leukemia. So they found when they reduced dietary folic acid that this actually improved um, leukemia outcome. So in 1947, uh, Sidney Farber and his colleagues evaluated the first antifolate aminocterin in pediatric ALL, and they found that this actually induced a remission. Um, so they subsequently developed methotrexate, which was approved in 1949. So how methotrexate works, it inhibits dihydrofolate reductase, which converts dihydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate. Um, so essentially create, uh, inhibits the creation of reduced folates. Um, when, we, when there is an absence of reduced folates, this prevents synthesis of thymidylate and purine nucleotides and subsequently inhibits DNA and RNA synthesis. Um, methotrexate can be given orally, IV, and intrathecally. Um, it has a very large dose range, anywhere from 5 milligrams to 2,000 milligrams per meter squared per dose, um, and also has many oncologic and non-oncologic indications. Um, when we talk about high-dose methotrexate, this is, um, these are doses over 500 milligrams per meter squared. These doses are fatal unless we use what is called a leucovorin rescue, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, we also have to give sodium bicarbonate fluids to maintain a urine pH at least seven or higher. Um, this is because methotrexate is insoluble in acidic environments, so we need to alkalinize the urine to avoid renal damage. Um, and that leucovorin rescue begins about 24 hours after methotrexate. Um, the other uh, supportive care piece we need to think about um, for delayed clearance with renal damage, um, and this is for significantly delayed clearance, and we'll talk about this in a bit as well, we consider an agent called glucarpidase. Uh, we also have a guideline that outlines all of these um, practices on Uconnect for your reference. So going back to the urine alkal alkalinization, in an ideal world, we would like these patients to start this on the outpatient side before they come inpatient um, to receive their methotrexate. Um, so what we instruct them to do is to mix a half teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate or baking soda uh, four times a day the day prior to admission and then around 8 a.m. the day of admission. This ex essentially jump starts the alkalinization process. And then the goal is by the time they get inpatient, we can get the bicarbonate fluids going um, and hopefully their urine will be alkalinized sooner. We can get the methotrexate started sooner. Um, so here's those sodium bicarbonate fluids I was talking about. We run it at a rate of 150 mils an hour. We get this started as soon as possible from the time of admission. Um, typically runs about four hours prior to the start of methotrexate. Um, and we also have boluses available if the urine pH were to fall below seven at any point. The nurses are checking these urine pHs. They check three hours after the start of the bicarb fluids and then two, four, and eight hours after the start of methotrexate. And then every eight hours until the methotrexate clears. Um, so going back to our leucovorin, so leucovorin bypasses dihydrofolate reductase for conversion to tetrahydrofolate, which is necessary for purine and pyrimidine synthesis. Um, doses that are above 25 should be administered IV for adequate absorption. Um, if we go above 25 with oral absorption, it's saturable 
uh, we're not going to see additional benefit. Um, it does not, so kind of a misconception, it does not increase methotrexate clearance. It just helps to minimize um, toxicities from methotrexate. Now uh, we also have in that methotrexate guideline um, a table that describes the different methotrexate levels at the different time levels and what the action is based off of those levels and based off of the um, serum creatinine at that time. So options are no change um, to increase fluid and or increase leucoborin and um, as we mentioned before to consider glucarpidase, which we will discuss in a bit. Uh, we also put in pharmacist notes for the 24 hour level. So essentially it includes the level um, their most recent creatinine, their weight, um, if they've had a weight change um, greater than 105% from their admission weight. Um, and then the last piece has a select on um, the methotrexate regimen. So there's a variety of different regimens and different infusions. Um, and based off of that, that guides us as far as um, based off of the level, if we need to make any changes um, to fluids or leucoborin. So going back to glucarpidase or varaxase, this is a recombinant carboxypeptidase enzyme, which degrades folic acid and methotrexate into inactive metabolites. Um, it essentially provides a non-renal pathway for methotrexate to be cleared. Um, the dose is 50 units per kilo IV over five minutes. Um, second and third doses are not recommended. Um, data did not show increased efficacy. Um, with additional doses, and we try to round this to the nearest thousand unit vial if we can. They're very expensive. Um, we don't always have it in stock, so if we're thinking of using it, we need to order it um, as soon as possible and drop ship it typically for the next day. Uh, for patients to be eligible for glucarpidase, they must meet a methotrexate concentration requirement and have evidence of impaired renal function meaning either a creatinine clearance of less than 60 or a creatinine greater than 150% of their baseline. Um, you can see the different um, methotrexate levels at the different time points there that makes them eligible. Um, blue carpet should not be given if the methotrexate blood concentration is less than one. Um, and it's reasonable to consider toxicities other than the renal impairment that we're discussing. Things like CNS toxicity, mucositis, et cetera, um, when we're determining if using blue carpet is appropriate for the patient. Uh, glucarpidase has no impact on intracellular methotrexate, so leucoborin is still needed to protect the cells. Uh, following glucarpidase, you can resume the leucoborin at the pre-glucarpidase dose and continue that for at least 48 hours. Um, we want to make sure we're separating these doses by two hours because leucoborin is also metabolized by glucarpidase. Um, and then after the glucarpidase dose, methotrexate levels are artificially elevated for the next 48 hours. Um, and serum cranin can also continue to rise before it starts to fall back down. So criteria for discharge, we need a methotrexate concentration of at least less than or equal to 0.1. If the level is less than or equal to 0.05, we can discharge these patients without um, some of the supportive care agents that we've been discussing. However, if the level is 0.06 to 0.1, these patients should be discharged on leucovorin, um, oral leucovorin, as well as um, directing them to take the baking soda every six hours until they have their follow-up level drawn within 48 hours of discharge. Uh, things that can delay methotrexate clearance, uh, like we've been discussing, renal dysfunction, um, third spacing is a big one as well, so patients with pleural effusions, ascites, or really significant edema um, can also have delayed clearance. Um, hepatic dysfunction, hypoalbuminemia, dehydration, and also a variety of drug interactions can interfere with clearance. Um, so there's a variety of ways that drugs can interfere um, with methotrexate clearance. One way is displacement of methotrexate from protein binding sites. This includes sulfonamides, so things like our Bactrim, um, salicylates like our aspirin, uh, phenytoin, and tetracyclines. Um, there are drugs that can increase urine acidity or reduce renal tubular transport. This would include folic acid, um, salicylates, and ascorbic acid. Um, there are drugs that can also compete for PGP transport, CYP450 metabolism, or renal excretion of me methotrexate. So this includes our NSAIDs, penicillins, cyclosporine, ciprofloxacin, and amiodarone. Um, and then there are other drugs that prolong the levels that we don't really know how it happens, but we know that it interferes. So 
our proton pump inhibitors, omeprazole, pantoprazole, um, those need to be held during methotrexate as well. Um, other acid reducers like famotidine are safe with methotrexate. So the next folic acid analog is pemetrexid. Um, so this inhibits three enzymes that are involved in folate metabolism and DNA synthesis. And you can see them listed there. Um, again, we do have that NSAID drug interaction um, and can decrease clearance. Um, again, we have supportive care that we need to think about with pemetrexid. Um, this includes both folic acid and vitamin B12, and this is to minimize the risk of toxicities, particularly myelosuppression and GI toxicity. Folic acid, ideally around a milligram a day starting a week prior to pemetrexid and continuing through treatment, as well as three weeks after the completion of treatment. Um, and then vitamin B12, 1,000 micrograms, IM a week prior, and then every three cycles or roughly every nine weeks. Um, during the pandemic, I did see people use oral um, to, just to minimize the amount of times patients are coming in if the IM doesn't always overlap, um, and that was sufficient as well. Um, I've also had questions about starting, if oftentimes with adherence, this is a, an issue with patients remembering to start this before treatment. As long as they don't have you know, any significant cytopenias, particularly anemia, um, Typically, it's okay uh, to move forward, but we just need to get these on board as soon as possible. And if you're ever not sure, you can just ask us. Um, and then dexamethasone is also given to minim minimize cutaneous reactions. Uh, so we start four milligrams orally twice a day, the day before, day of, and day after each dose of pemetrexid. Next is our pralotrexate. This inhibits dihydrofolate reductase. Again, um, supportive care, we still need our folic acid and vitamin B12, ideally a milligram a day of the folic acid starting 10 days prior to the first dose and continuing throughout treatment and for 30 days after the final dose. And then vitamin B12, typically within 10 weeks prior to starting treatment, so much earlier, um, and then every eight to 10 weeks during treatment. And again, both of these are designed to help minimize uh, myelosuppression from treatment. All right, so our folic acid analogs, looking at side effects and dose limiting toxicities, um, like we discussed with methotrexate, AKI, mucositis, elevated LFTs, um, dermatitis, and neurotoxicity are all possibilities. Um, with pemetrexid, you can see arthralgias, rashes, and desquamation. Um, and then with pralotrexate, you can see mucositis, fever, edema, fatigue, and elevated LFTs as well. Um, Myelosuppression is a big one, so we need to make sure we're supplement, supplementing with B12 and folic acid for our pemetrexid and prelotrexate. Um, this is just a table for your reference um, of these three agents. You can see methotrexate has a variety of indications, both in the heme and um, solid tumor world, but also some non-oncologic indications um, like rheumatoid arthritis and others. Um, pemetrexid is really strictly used in non-small cell lung cancer and mesothelioma. And then our pralotrexate is used in T-cell lymphomas. Um, and then you can see those considerations that we discussed um, with supplementation and supportive care and then dose adjustments for these agents. All right, so our next um, category of anti-metabolites is our purine analogs. This includes mercaptopurine, thioguanine, pentastatin, cladribine, loferabine, scuderabine, and nilarabine. We'll talk about each of these. So mercaptopurine or 6-MP and thioguanine are structural analogs of purine bases, which undergo conversion to substrates that get incorporated into DNA and subsequently inhibit, again, DNA and RNA synthesis. Um, there are some mechanisms of resistance that can develop with these agents, um, and there are a few different ways, decreased entry into the cell, um, lack of HGPRT activity, which is required to activate these agents, um, as well as increased degradation. So there's a variety of side effects with these agents as well. Um, you'll see the common theme of the dose-limiting toxicity being myelosuppression, um, you can also see increased exposure for patients with TPMT or NUDT15 deficiency that can lead to severe myelosuppression. Um, as of now, there's no guideline to say, yes, you should be checking for this before you start these agents. It is just a consideration. Um, and obviously, if you were to see a patient who was struggling with 
you know, profound myelosuppression um, or struggling with toxicity with these agents, then that may be something to consider checking. Um, you can also see hyperuricemia. 6-MP, or the mercaptopurine, is metabolized to an inactive metabolite by xanthine oxidase. Um, xanthine oxidase is the enzyme that creates uric acid. Um, and allopurinol, uh, which we use to decrease the risk of tumor lysis syndrome, um, interferes with this because it is an inhibitor of xanthine oxidase. So we recommend avoiding allopurinol, if possible, um, for patients who are on these agents. Um, these agents can also elevate LFTs, cause mucositis and stomatitis, and a rash. The next agent is pentostatin. So this inhibits adenosine deaminase, um, and that leads to the accumulation of intracellular adenosine and deoxyadenosine nucleotides, again, blocking DNA th synthesis and leading to cell death. <clears throat> again, dose-limiting toxicity is myelosuppression. Other side effects that we can see with this agent include opportunistic infections, rash, fatigue, and headache. Our next agent is cladribine, and this is a prodrug which requires intracellular phosphorylation in order to become active, um, and then is incorporated into the DNA, leading to DNA strand breaks, and again, in inhibition of DNA synthesis. Our dose-limiting toxicity is myelosuppression. Um, it does have profound immunosuppression by decreasing our CD4 and CD8 cells, and this can last for several years, so these patients are at risk of opportunistic infections. Other side effects include nausea and rash. Our next agent is clofarabine. This inhibits ribonucleotide reductase, terminates DNA chain elongation, and inhibits DNA synthesis and repair. Dose-limiting toxicity is myelosuppression. We also see infections, elevated LFTs, um, GI toxicities, dermatologic toxicities, and cytokine release syndrome or a capillary leak syndrome. Our next agent is fludarabine. Um, this is a structural analog of adenosine, and it inhibits DNA synthesis and elongation of DNA strands. Also inhibits RNA polymerase as well. Again, our dose-limiting toxicity is myelosuppression. We can also see fever, diarrhea, um, neurotoxicity at high doses. Um, and this neurotoxicity can actually be a delayed toxicity as well. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And then the larabine is a prodrug that's metabolized into era GTP, and this is incorporated into DNA and again subsequently inhibits DNA synthesis. Um, and this can accumulate in higher concentrations in T cells specifically, which is why this agent is used strictly in T cell ALL and T cell lymphoma. Um, and then we, for dose limiting toxicities, we can see neurologic toxicities. Also, myelosuppression, flu-like syndrome, symptoms, elevated LFTs, and edema. Um, so here are all these agents we just discussed. Um, in a table for your reference, you can see all the indications are um, primarily our heme malignancies. Fludarabine we do use in our bone marrow transplant conditioning regimens, as well as our lymphodepleting regimens for CAR-T. Um, and then you can see the dose adjustments on the right-hand side. Um, including that TPMT and NUD15 deficiency that we discussed. All right, next category is our pyrimidine analogs. This includes 5-fluorouracil, capecitabine, floxiridine, cytarabine, and gemcitabine. So starting off with 5-fluorouracil or 5-FU. So 5-FU inhib inhibits thymidylate synthase, which is the rate-limiting step in the formation of thymidine, and 5-FU is converted to 5-FDUMP, which binds to thymidylate synthase and results in suicide inhibition of the enzyme. This leads to deficiency in thymidine and inhibition of DNA and RNA synthesis. Capecitabine is our oral prodrug that is converted to 5-FU in vivo. And fluoxyridine is a chemical analog of 5-FU, meaning it is structurally similar to 5-FU. Um, and fluoxyridine is really unique. It's administered as a continuous infusion into the hepatic artery. Um, it's an intra-arterial infusion, and it's only used for hepatic metastases and colorectal cancer. Um, so DPD deficiency is something we want to think about with these agents as well. 
Um, DPD processes thymine, uracil, and metabolizes fluorouracil and capecitabine. Um, so when we, uh, for this deficiency, it can be associated with an increase in side effects um, because they're going to have more exposure to the drugs when they're not able to metabolize them. This can include cytopenias, mucositis, and diarrhea. Uh, we can see partial deficiency in three to six percent of patients. Again, just like the other deficiencies we discussed with TPMT and NUDT15, um, routine testing is not done right now. It's just something to consider. Um, guidelines just recommend consideration. And again, if you see these patients are really struggling with tolerance, then that might be something to think about looking at. All right, so our infusional 5-FU and Cape Cytobine. Um, so infusional 5-FU would be like our 5-FU pumps that run um, for 46 hours. Our dose limiting toxicities include hand foot syndrome, stomatitis, and diarrhea. Also can see nail changes, photosensitivity, and angina. Our bolus 5-FU has a different toxicity profile. The dose limiting toxicity is myelosuppression. Um, so for patients who are really struggling with myelosuppression, if they're getting both a bolus 5-FU followed by an infusional 5-FU, we can drop the bolus. Um, and drop, we'll talk about leucovorin, but we can drop the leucovorin and we can continue the infusional 5-FU. So depending on the toxicities they're experiencing, we can alter um, what type of 5-FU they're getting. And then floxiridine, uh, side effects include stomatitis, diarrhea, and myelosuppression. Um, so we do have an agent to help with overdose of these agents. Um, uridine triacetate or Vistagard reduces incorporation of fluorouridine triphosphate into RNA of hematopoietic progenitor cells and GI mucosal cells to reduce fluorouracil toxicity in normal tissues. Um, so our restrictions for this agent, we can use this following fluorouracil or capecitabine overdose, regardless of the presence of symptoms or when patients are exhibiting um, certain symptoms after fluorouracil or capecitabine administration. This includes early onset severe or life-threatening toxicities or early onset unusually severe adverse reactions within 96 hours of administration. Uh, so this will include things like GI toxicity or neutropenia. Um, doses of Visigard are given orally every six hours for 20 doses. We want to begin this as soon as possible after a known overdose um, or early onset toxicity within 96 hours after the end of fluorouracil or capecitabine. Again, here is a chart for your reference. So you can see 5-FU and Cape Cytobine are used in a variety of our um, solid tumor um, disease states. And we can see as well that you can use it as a radiosensitizer with radiation. Um, and then under special considerations for 5-FU, like I was discussing, leucovorin is actually used in this setting to enhance the cytotoxic effect of the 5-FU bolus. Um, so keep that in mind. And then um, you can see the floxuridine is used in our colorectal cancer with liver mets, and it's an intra-arterial infusion. And then we have renal and hepatic dose adjustments to consider for each. Next is our cytarabine or ARAC. So this requires intracellular phosphorylation in order to be activated. Um, and it gets incorporated into DNA, inhibits DNA polymerase, and then blocks DNA elongation, again, leading to cell death. Gemcitabine is structurally similar to cytarabine or ARC. It also inhibits DNA polymerase and RNA reductase. It prevents DNA repair, contributes to DNA strand termination, and again, leads to cell death. Uh, so lo looking at the toxicities of these agents, both agents, the dose limiting toxicity is myelosuppression. Um, with cytarabine or ARC, we can see rash, fever, nausea, um, there is something called cytarabine or ARC syndrome that can present as fever, muscle, bone, or chest pain, rash, and malaise. Um, our high-dose ARC, or um, our term HIDAC, uh, these are doses 1,000 milligrams per meter squared or greater. We can see cerebellar toxicity with this. Um, so things like confusion, ataxia, drowsiness, they're required to have a neuro exam before each dose to make sure it's safe to proceed with the next dose. Um, we also can see um, some corneal toxicity and conjunctivitis. And so we give these patients steroid eye drops prophylactically. 
they start these eye drops before the infusions start, and then ideally would continue for 48 hours at the end of the last infusion. And for gemcitabine, um, one of the more common side effects that we can see is flu-like symptoms. This is typically, if you're going to see it, would be after the first dose, roughly six to 12 hours after the first dose. Um, can also see fever, elevated LFTs, interstitial pneumonitis, and hemolytic uremic syndrome. Um, again, we have a chart for your reference. So cytarabine, we see in our um, hemolignancies. Again, we can use it in some of our bone marrow conditioning bone marrow transplant conditioning regimens. Gemcitabine is primarily used in our um, solid tumors, but we also can occasionally use it in our lymphomas. Um, with cytarabine, it can be given intrathecally, IV, or sub-Q. Um, and again, like we discussed, HIDEF requires steroid eye drops in the narrow exam before each dose. Um, and then something to think about with cytarabine as well for our HIDAC. Um, there is a pretty low age cutoff before we would consider reducing. So 40, greater than 40 years old, we would want to talk about a dose reduction. Um, and then there's some renal and hepatic dose adjustments for each as well. Next is our hypo, next and last is our hypomethylating agents. So this includes azacitabine, decitabine, and acitabine, and cidaziridine. So azacitidine is an analog of cytidine, and this gets incorporated into DNA, causes demethylation and cell death. Um, it has direct cytotoxicity. The cytidine gets incorporated into DNA as well and causes demethylation and death, um, and also causes double DNA strand breaks. Again, the dose limiting toxicity for both of these agents is myelosuppression. Um, as a class, these agents also can cause arthralgias, headaches, elevated LFTs, um, and GI symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Uh, we can see injection site reactions with azacitidine um, and can see a rash with the cytidine. Again, we have a table here for your reference. Azacitidine and decitabine are used in AML and MDS. Um, and azacitidine can be given IV or sub-Q. Decitabine is just IV. Um, and there are things to consider with dose adjustments related to creatinine um, and hepatic impairment as well. So decitabine and cidaziridine or Encovi is actually a pill. Um, it was approved back in 2020 for MDS. I don't think I've ever seen this used, um, but it is still approved for MDS, comes as a tablet, um, and it's a combination of decitabine and then a cytidine deaminase inhibitor. Um, cidaziridine. Um, so it's kind of like our, if you think of like amoxicillin, clavulanate. Clavulanate is the beta lactamase inhibitor. Um, so essentially what both of those are doing is increasing um, systemic exposure of the active drug. So in this case, the decitabine. Uh, the recommended dosage is one tablet a day, days one through five of each 28-day cycle. Should be taken on an empty stomach, has a similar side effect profile to IV decitabine. And that is all I have for you. What questions do you have for me? <laughs> I have one quick question. This might be a little bit naive, so I feel like I should already know the answer to this, but I don't. Um, when you're dealing with 5-FU and you drop the bolus, do you, it makes sense to just drop the <laughs> infusional leucovorin as well, right, if there's no bolus? Correct. There are some instances, okay, right, where you would keep the leucovorin on. I, I don't know who just asked the Dr. question. Evan. Oh, who is it? Okay. So there are some providers, Medox, here that will drop the bolus or drop the leucovorin because it makes no sense to boost a continuous infusion 5-FU based on half-life of leucovorin. But then there are others who feel like why not? It's cheap. Let's just keep it in there. So our practice here at UW is all across the board. As a pharmacist, I'm always a pro. Drop the leucovorin if you drop the bolus. Um, very interestingly, though, in pancreatic cancer, the neoadjuvant and adjuvant data for modified fulfirinox, they actually did not have a 5-FU bolus, but they had leucovorin plus a continuous infusion 5-FU, which is just, I don't know why it was studied that way. 
clearly there wasn't a pharmacist on that research study. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. I know that's a lot of information in a short amount of time, but if you have questions, you can always reach out to us. Thank you. Your slide deck is up. And is it? Oh, my, thank you. Okay. I'm taking my mask off, folks. I cannot chat with a mask on. Some of you, this is probably your first time seeing my. Oh, wait. Is it like. Exit out and then. Yeah. On the bottom. On the bottom. On the bottom. On the bottom. bottom. Woohoo. Okay. Not the display settings. Display. Do you duplicate. Yeah, I didn't know that. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Good morning. Um, happy Monday. For those who do not know me, I'm Liz Dowhill Gartner. I primarily practice within our GI brain and breast cancer space in clinic. So if you ever see me in clinic and you have questions, um, feel free that you can always reach out and ask me. It's a pleasure being here. Today I'm talking about immunotherapy, which I feel like it started to come about when I was finishing residency. So I feel like that new age, like my you know career is kind of the immune checkpoint inhibitors. But without further ado, let's get started. So the FDA approval timeline, I think it's important to know where we came from. Um, our original drug was ipilimumab, as you can see, approved in 2011. So it's been around for over a decade now. That shows you how old I am. That's when I finished pharmacy school. Fast forward, pembrolizumab and nivolumab were in 2014. These approvals were all, all for melanoma. And then as you see, we fast forward, we get atezolizumab, abalumab, dervalumab, semiflumab, dostarlumab, and then the newest guy on the block is nivolumab plus relatlumab. Um, and we'll talk about mechanisms. But as you can see, we've really rapidly advanced in terms of all the different immune checkpoint inhibitors that are available. So where do they target? I wish I had a pointer. Where, oh, maybe I'll use this. So where do they target? So let's go to the original, the OG, the ipilimumab. That one targets CTLA-4. The PD-1s were then kind of the next, nivolumab and Pembro, and then semiflumab and dostalumab. They all work essentially the same. <clears throat> Atezolizumab, avalumab, and duralumab are your pd one so they get a little bit more specific for the tumor cell. Again, these functions are on the T cell. And then leg three is our newest addition, which is the relatlumab, which is in combination with nivolumab. So I pulled this from um, OpduLeg is the uh, brand name of this drug, their website, because in a very simple term and when I'm like talking to patients, cancer cells are really tricky and they essentially, I, I visualize them as making the T cells really tired and fatigued and therefore your T cells are not doing what they normally would be doing. And then the drugs come into play and then you have an active T cell. So it goes from a tired T cell to an active T cell. Great, you know, advertising by the drug company, but it kind of helps, you know, make it a little bit more better for the patients. CTLA-4, we only have one available on the market and that's ipilimumab. Again, it binds to CTLA-4, which is a down regulator of the T cell activation pathway. It allows more T cell activation and proliferation. So I gotta change this picture out because I always mimic Toby Campbell with this because he has shoes that look like this and now he has these fancy white ones. But essentially I think of it as releasing the break on the immune system. And so if you allow, allow that break to come off, your immune system kind of comes full forth. And we'll talk about side effects and how that differs. PD-1 inhibitors, Pembro, Nevo, Semiflumab, Dostarlumab. We are predominantly a Pembro nivolumab. You will see niche indications for Semiflumab, but we do not have Dostarlumab on formulary, um, just because it's kind of a me-too drug. PDL one getting more specific to the tumor cell, Atezo, Atezo Derva, and Avalumab are our all here. Again, they all have their niche indications. They're not as common. You'll see a lot of atezolizumab, but not a lot of dervalumab and avalumab at this time. Okay, so I'm a Harry Potter, you know, I love Harry Potter, but when you're trying to talk to patients about this and how these drugs work and saying, oh, your immune system is going to be more active. Well, I kind of visualize it as Harry Potter removing that cloak of invisibility. So especially patients around my age or a little bit older, they'll understand that. Older folks, I have to use a different analogy, but it helps patients to visualize kind of what they're thinking about. So <clears throat> Game of Clones, I don't know if anybody's watching the new, yeah. Um, all, it seems like all drug companies have a different PD-1, PD-L1 
here all of them are listed. They all are trying. It's like the great fight, you know, to get that iron throne in a way of who gets the most indications, which it can be overwhelming if you're keeping up on the literature because these indications, these drugs, they seem to be changing so rapidly. And that's where this website comes into play. I won't actually go to the website, but um, I found this, I think it was last year that I actually found it, but if you go to it, it has these really nice grids where, you know, as you can see, this is, I, I had to crop it because I couldn't fit it all. But, you know, back in 2014 was when the melanoma indications were happening and there's different drug, the colors mean different drugs. But you can see all the different indications on the top and then the years kind of increases where the most recent would be your bottom. What's really nice is when you hover over that specific indication, you're going to find the literature or the study that was done for them. So you have all these different, you know, checkmate studies and keynote studies, and I can't keep track of those numbers. So this website has actually been a really good tool for me um, for looking up of what's been approved and what data it's based off of. <clears throat> so a little bit more about ipilimumab. The dosing is listed here. We seem to be segueing from three mg per kg IV for four to every three weeks for four doses, and doing more of one mg per kg every three weeks for four doses. Or you're probably going to see more of a trend towards the one mg per kg every six weeks. There's some trials that do it every 12 weeks. Again, we're discovering that we don't need that big of a dose of ipilimumab for it to be successful. There's no renal dosing adjustments. Um, you know, hepatic impairment is interesting with any immune checkpoint inhibitor because they can affect hepatic um, uh, function. So we usually just are monitoring. We do know, for example, with any immune checkpoint inhibitor in hepatic function, if you come in with baseline hepatic dysfunction, that sometimes can predispose you to having more hepatic dysfunction from immune checkpoint inhibitors. Half-life is listed here. We're gonna go through more of the toxicities, the itises coming up, but I figure just to be all inclusive. Drug interactions, we know venurapinib, that was a um, hepatotoxicity did significantly increase. That was done with early melanoma data. And then I kind of put antibiotic steroid PPIs. This is an ever evolving you know, field where we're discovering that maybe some of our oral uh, meds that patients are taking are actually affecting their microbiome, which then causes less eff um, efficacy for these drugs. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Mr. Hannah. Hey, why do we give like set four doses of IPI? That is how it was studied um, in the early days of melanoma. Interestingly, some of the newer ones where they do it every six or 12 weeks, those do not have set number doses. Additionally, if you look in the package insert for IPI for adjuvant melanoma, and we do not use this, they use like ipilimumab 10 mg per kg, and they do it for a full year. That is really went to the wayside, and I don't, I don't know a single institution that's using that. But that was just how it was studied, that original four doses. Okay, thanks. Great question. Yeah, for folks on the line, feel free at any point in time, ask questions. Uh, P1 inhibitors. Okay, so Pembro, Nevo, Semiclomab, Dostarlamab, all listed here. Their half-lives are listed here. Again, drug interactions, potentially antibiotic steroids, PPI, so things to be cognizant of. PDL ones, all listed on the bottom here. The Tezo, Derva, and Evalumab. Um, again, very, you know, there's really no renal adjustments. You have to, of course, watch hepatic function. Watch out for potential drug-drug interactions. We'll go through the itises. Leg three, new guy, um, in combination with nivolumab, so you will never see relapilumab given by itself. Um, very similar across the board in terms of, you know, we really don't have dose adjustments for these. Half-life is relatively the same of nivolumab. Where I want to spend the bulk of the time is going through how to manage immune-mediated adverse effects. I think you were just in clinic talking about potential adverse effects from, yep. So this is kind of a big area. We're using these drugs for so many more indications now. Um, and so that's where the bulk of the conversation is going to focus today. We call them the itises. Um, when you essentially allow your immune system to be more active, I always visualize it as, well, any sort of body tissue can also be affected. And so that's where these side effects come into play. We know some side effects are more common than others. We kind of know a timeline of when something can appear. 
But to be honest, some side effects like, for example, rash, which we know can occur usually within the first, you know, six to 12 weeks, it can really occur at any point in time, it appears. But I like this paper. It's kind of old. It's now kind of outdated 2016, but it lists out all the different itises that we know that can occur in all the different body systems that can be affected. So I like the history of melanoma treatment to show the percentages of side effects and toxicities. So we really do not even talk about IL-2. Um, here we do not do it at this institution. This is like feeding gas to the immune system is what I visualize this as. I think there's still some centers that do IL-2. It's still on the guideline, but we do not do it here. So as you can see, approximate number of patients with grade three toxicities, 85%. Patients are admitted to an ICU and monitored the entire, I know, it's crazy. Um, as you can see here, capillary leak syndrome, hypotension, fevers, all can happen with IL-2. Now, if ipilimumab, the CTLA-4, this was the releasing the break on the immune system, approximate number of patients with grade three toxicities, 26%. Nevo and Pembro, the PD-1, again, you're kind of getting a little bit more specific, you know, kind of uncloaking the immune system, 15% on average in clinical trials. Then we combined a CTLA-4 plus a PD-1, about half of patients actually experience a grade three adverse effect. If you look at different disease states that have an indication for IPI plus NEVO, such as like renal cell, for example, they're dosing when they did the one meg per keg instead of three megs per keg, they tend to have less side effects. So this number is lower with using a lower IPI dose. And then finally, the new guy, nivolumab plus relatumab, only 40%. So in melanoma, these two have not been compared head to head, but sometimes, you know, the provider will look at and say, well, there's less grade three adverse effects associated with this. They might pick that over the other. This beautiful graph shows us the timeline of um, different immune-related adverse effects. This one is just from ipilimumab. When this graph came out based on the data that we had, this was a really big paper that showed us these time courses. So when you're talking with patients, it could be helpful. As we can see, get my pointer right here, roughly about after week three, that's when your rash and itching tends to go up. Fast forward about five weeks, that's when the diarrhea seems to occur and then it peaks and then it usually is down by 10 weeks. You usually don't see diarrhea beyond 10 weeks from ipilimumab, but then after six weeks is when you can see the liver toxicity and hypophysitis um, occur. Now with more data from PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors, here are some different graphs. So here's your original ipilimumab. Here is ipilimumab plus PD-1. You still have the same ipilimumab side effects, but we notice with PD-1s that they have sometimes their own unique side effects. Where's my, where's my thing here? Here is, you can see nephritis occur. You can see pneumonitis occur. Again, these are more associated with the PD-1 inhibitors. Liver toxicities, everything when we combined it is just more bigger and uh, higher percentage of side effects. PD-1 by itself, here's the nephritis. We really do not see that with ipilimumab. And here's the pneumonitis curve, things that you will see patients, um, unfortunately, develop from these therapies. I will say when people educate patients, you say, you know what, in general, these are pretty well tolerated compared to that more cytotoxic chemotherapy, especially with nausea, vomiting, blood counts. But um, I think some patients go away with thinking that they're never going to experience a side effect and then something happens and they're like, what? Um, and so kind of being cognizant of the itises when you do patient teaching is really important. I did find, um, side note, NCCN has a really good document um, for patient education on immune checkpoint inhibitors. So feel free to use that. We do use that in clinic for educating patients, especially about the itises and what to watch out for. Listed here on the slide is the monitoring. This is pulled directly from NCCN guidelines, which goes through what to monitor. There hasn't been a lot of big shifts in what we do. The biggest thing I would say in the past two years is we no longer um, have like amylase and lipase built within our um, treatment plans because it's not recommended to monitor those unless patients are symptomatic. But you will have built in your treatment plan and we're trying to get them to all look and be the same. Um, you'll have cortisol, you know, your uh, T3, free T4, and you'll have your CBC and CMP built within those plans. 
<clears throat> so what do you do when your patient has a side effect? Listed here on the slides, we have a guideline at UW here, but it is, I would say, very outdated, and we're going to be referencing other out, um, external guidelines to follow because, again, this field rapidly changes in terms of how we manage things. ASCO just came up with an uh, came out with an update, excuse me, in 2021, so that's a really good reference to use. In addition to NCCN, uh, which uh, seems to update about at least every six to 12 months for their new checkpoint inhibitors. But the general principle of managing these, you got to grade it, and then based on that's going to tell you what to do. Usually, if it's a grade one, you can continue therapy and just close monitoring. Grade two, you usually are holding, sometimes holding, sometimes continuing, and then you usually let things settle down and you can resume once it's on grade one or less. Steroids might be administered. Grade three or four, these are usually... Um, usually the immunotherapy is held. If it's a grade four, it's usually a permanent discontinuation. And then this is when you're going to see high dose corticosteroids used in addition to other therapies if the steroids aren't working. So let's go through some patient cases. So MJ is a 66 year old female. She's newly diagnosed with metastatic melanoma. She presents to clinic for initiation of um, Ipi and Nevo. There's her past medical history or past surgical history, nothing really too um, of importance there. Allergies, sulfa, she had a skin rash, she's intolerant to aspirin, she's a really hardy 66 year old, she's a porn status of zero. Medications listed here. She presents prior to cycle three of Ipi and Nevo, um, and during the follow up phone call, she reported a mild rash in her upper chest. We managed topically with hydrocortisone 2.5% cream, occasionally use of diphenhydramine. Today, she reports the rashes that are increasing in size and remains itchy. So the assessment of it, she's a few scattered areas of rash on her upper chest, her abdomen, her arms, upper thighs, estimated to be about 15 to 20% of her BSA. So dermatologic toxicities is one of the most common ones, which is why I always like to talk about it. All therapies are implicated, although we do know anti-CTLA-4 and PD-1s in combination have the highest risk of them. Onset is usually within the first several weeks of treatment, so it's something that when you're educating a patient, be very cognizant of rash, especially in the next, I always say, like six to 12 weeks. Most common is a red maculopapular rash, um, sometimes itchy, sometimes not. And then it's really important for these patients with rashes to report in early if they're experiencing one, because that's going to help to like nip things in the butt sooner rather than letting things um, rapidly spread. So here, pulling from um, CTCAE is how you grade them. You know, looking at the BSA is really important to quantify in order to grade it appropriately. For example, grade two, your BSA is 10 to 30%. She had 15 to 20% of her body affected. How do you calculate? If you guys are not aware already, the rule of nines, kind of adding up the percentages across the body based on how much um, or where the rash is across the body and adding up those numbers up. So, what grade of toxicity is MJ experiencing? Two. I got a two from the audience. That's correct. B. So, what do we do about that? Listen here on the slide is pulled from NCCN. Um, and I did look at ASCO too. Their guidelines are, real, are essentially the same. Grade one, if you if you see this, you're going to use topical emollients and moderate potency topical corticosteroids. Avoid sun irritants or skin irritants and sun exposure, oral antihistamine for itching. You can continue drug though in those patients. Grade two, essentially the same, but you're going to bump to maybe doing a medium to high potency topical uh, corticosteroids. And then if a patient's unresponsive to topicals, that's when you might add a low dose prednisone, so 0.5 mg per kg per day. Guidelines really aren't clear on taper, but usually you would do a slower taper with those patients. But you can technically consider or um, consider continuing therapy. If you're at the point, though, where you're starting oral prednisone, I would probably hold and reassess in a week. And then grade three or four, biggest change, you're going to increase your uh, topical potency of your corticosteroid. And then you're going to be usually, if it's a grade three or four, you're going to usually see a bigger dose steroid, even though it's listed in the guidelines as 0 0.5 to 1. Most people tend to start with one and go from there. But then again, you're going to hold um, ICPI therapy and consult dermatology. We have an excellent Oncoderm team here, so feel free if you have a grade three or four toxicity that's really severe to reach out to them. 
in the UW guidelines is this table, which I find excellent and I always reference. Um, it's actually the potency of co common topical corticosteroids, the strengths, and then how they come. So very interestingly, I think a lot of people think hydrocortisone is a really uh, potent topical corticosteroid. It's not. I always think it's cute. It's the least potent, but sometimes 2.5% hydrocortisone cream works a lot really well for people. But like looking at, for example, our medium potency, you're going to see your triamcinolone creams. Here's their strengths, glutecazone, ultra high. You're going to see um, your clobetazole, for example. Dosage vehicle also matters. Um, I know our Oncoderm team for a patient with like grade three or four will use like an ointment. But if it's a grade two skin reaction and telling a person to slather ointment all over their body, most people are not happy with you. So just be cognizant of like where it is and what vehicle you're using because you want them to be using it, not not using it. Um, so there's different lotions and creams that can be just as effective. The ointments sometimes, of course, are really, really um, thick and greasy and sometimes patients don't like to use those. So going back to MJ, it's great to ICPI induced skin rash. We're going to hold for a week, start supportive care meds. Patient would like to avoid oral steroids. She says she gets really um, a, a huge amount of anxiety from steroids, so she wants to avoid those. We're going to follow up in a week. So based on her grade 2 toxicity and the fact that we're avoiding oral steroids, what would you recommend? Clobetazole and hydroxazine, diphenhydramine and uh, topical cream and oral diphenhydramine, hydrocortisone cream and diphenhydramine, or triamcinolone and hydroxazine. Anyone? Think D. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I kind of tricked you. I already said clobetazole is ultra high. She doesn't need that. B doesn't have a topical steroid. C, 2.5% cream is the least potent. Yes, your right answer is triamcinolone. So she presents back to clinic one week later. Her rash unfortunately continued to worsen and she didn't call in, which is sometimes not surprising with patients. Now she has rash um, covering 50% of her BSA. She now has grade three um, ICPI induced skin rash. So at that point in time, usually you might get a dermatology consult or potentially rule out um, other sources of rash for the patient. So making sure you do a full med review, making sure they're not more serious like Stevens Johnson or TENS, for example, um, and doing your full workup and seeing if there's any other causes for um, the worsening of the rash. So now that she has grade three skin rash, what would be her best treatment option? Continue ICPI, admit for IV methylpred, continue ICPI, admit for PO pred, hold ICPI, admit for IV methylpred, or hold ICPI and admit for PO pred. This one technically didn't have two answers, but I'm trying to lead you guys for success if you admit a patient with grade three skin toxicity. C, did I hear a C? Yeah, if you're, you should hold ICPI. If you're gonna admit the patient, I would do a couple doses of IV methylpred before transitioning oral over to PO pred. I don't know, Mike, if you have any other insight on that admission wise. Yeah, it's a quick transition if they respond yes. well, but otherwise, yeah. yeah. Then at least you know they're getting their full dose. Okay, so she presents the clinic one week after discharging from the hospital. You usually have to do a slow taper for these patients. So it's nothing where you can go from 60 for five days and then off as you see. Um, was the um, taper that we did for this patient. Make sure there's other supportive care meds, like if she needs PJP prophylaxis or um, a PPI or H2 blocker, making sure the patient's all set up with that too. Let's move into patient. This is Amy Taylor. Can I ask a question about the first case? Yeah. Um, when we were like internal medicine residents and we gave out steroids, we usually had like time limited because we were worried about what it would do to the skin to be on a topical steroid for a long time. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's different for patients with checkpoint inhibitor toxicity. Is there like a maximum time that they can keep using these for or should you ever give them a break if they keep having a rash? It depends. So usually the, uh, the rash is going to respond within one to two weeks and that's perfectly fine to use the topical steroids at that time. If it's on the face, you don't like to use really potent ones on the face. And so sometimes getting away with hydrocortisone two and a half percent cream is better on like the face, for example. But usually the topical steroids can be 
quickly tapered off in a week or two with um, significant rashes. That's the beauty of like if the patient started on oral steroids or IV steroids. Good question. ICPI case number two, we're gonna do this one fast. Um, no significant past medical history, VG is 50 years old, he has pdl one positive metastatic gastric cancer, he has started on Pembro, presents to the ED after his fourth treatment, he has fatigue, nausea, nominal pain, look at his labs. Thank goodness his bilirubin is normal, but his ALT and AST um, unfortunately are um, climbing. So hepatitis, we have built within our treatment plans, you most likely are gonna see LFTs monitored prior to each cycle to make sure something like this is not happening. Um, as you can see, you take your AST and ALT and you figure out how many times above the upper limit of normal they are, and then based on that grade, it's gonna tell you what to do with the drugs and then what to do after that. The one thing I will say from this slide, if you have a patient with hepatitis and they're not responding to steroids, you usually use mycophenolate. You do not go to infliximab compared to like a GI toxicity. So according to our guidelines, what would be the best initial recommendation for management of grade three, which is what this patient had? Continue immunotherapy, hold immunotherapy and consider corticosteroids, hold immunotherapy and administer infliximab, or D, permanently discontinue and uh, immunotherapy and administer IV steroids. So if we go back, I didn't go through this that great. Wait, sorry, what did you say? Yep, yep. So you are going to hold it and you're going to most likely give steroids. Some providers will sometimes watch that, but most often you're going to see them start steroids. So it's grade three, we're going to hold, we're going to initiate prednisone one to two follow, um, monitor LFTs every one to five days, and then you taper prednisone over four to six weeks. Although in some cases, you might see that taper done longer based on what the LFTs were. So I got two minutes. So my experience way back when in 2014, I love to tell this story. I had a patient who was found down unconscious by her husband. She was transferred to a local hospital, so not our healthcare system, which is where she got her cancer care. She had a delayed diagnosis of DKA and adrenal insufficiency because they had no idea that she was on an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Her husband didn't even know. She was extremely private and didn't like to tell folks. That's a different scenario to go through. But it resulted in a 14-day hospital stay. Again, not all systems are connected. So this was actually when I was at the Mayo Clinic and it was a really small hospital that this patient was admitted and they didn't have access to our records. So she was being treated with pembrolizumab. They didn't know what drug she was getting, which helps dictate, again, if they knew she was on Pembro, they might, be, might have been looking for different side effects. Um, and then there's this long delay in identifying that the patient was on therapy. She had a new onset of type one diabetes and adrenal insufficiency, and these were all related to her Pembrolizumab. So based on that um, scenario, we developed a program back here in 2017 where your clinic pharmacists meet with all patients who start immune checkpoint inhibitors. The biggest thing is that we reinforce any teaching on what to watch out for side effect wise, and we give them all wallet cards. That wallet card contains the drugs that they are, the drugs that they are on, their provider, and contact information to call here if something happens. The back of the wallet card contains side effects to watch out for. So if the patient's ever wondering, eh, should I call in? Like I'm having diarrhea, it's gonna help to dictate what they do with that. So again, we've been doing this for almost five years now, which is really, really crazy. Um, based on pilot program with two and a half years of data, we discovered that pharmacists were um, discovering over half of the side effects, because usually we could catch if a patient was having a skin toxicity or diarrhea, for example. Now that this there's rapidly evolving landscape and a lot of different cancers have immune checkpoint inhibitors as part of their treatment, we're kind of seeing what we should do next in terms of helping patients with this, but just know that pharmacists are really actively involved with immune checkpoint inhibitors in clinic. Uh, final ICPI thoughts. It's sometimes not just an ICPI drug, but it can become in combination with oral, oral cancer therapies or cytotoxic chemotherapies, which sometimes can make teasing out what side effects are what uh, a little bit more difficult and challenging. Our treatment plans, um, you'll be able to search within HealthLink to find all the treatment plans related on the indication. 
As you can see here, for example, the first one listed, there's uh, Pembro has a broad indication of patients who have MSI or are MSI high or mismatch repair deficient. That's like a blanket one. So if you see a patient, that's its own specific treatment plan. And then we do have the Pembro 400 built every six weeks. Again, you got to press what um, daughter indication it is for, but that can be tricky to find. Ask us if you're struggling to find it. Okay, I'm over time. Questions? I'm back tomorrow. <laughs> Use your neighborhood friendly pharmacist, please. Um, we've been doing this for many, many years. And I know, you know, kind of coming into your fellowship, maybe not having a lot of experience, we can absolutely help to guide you guys. Is there a lot of data on like the, the concern about diminishing efficacy of your checkpoint inhibitors once you initiate like steroids, or especially high dose? Yep. So we do know that you know, if a patient has a really bad toxicity, like a grade three or four, and they've gotten a couple doses, they might actually have a really good disease response, which is really cool, right? Like I've, I've had patients where they've gotten one or two doses, colitis, but still are disease free. So it's almost like that side effect was worth it. Um, we do know, you know, the studies will have either prednisone 20, I've seen some with prednisone 10, where if they're on those doses, they're excluded from clinical trials, where then you might be concerned with pred 20 of diminishing efficacy. You're gonna see treatment plans built. Um, so like some of the lung ones that are chemo, that are moderate to high risk amenogenicity, plus an immune checkpoint inhibitor, they're gonna have DEX post-treatment. That really does not diminish the efficacy of the immune checkpoint. Other questions? Are there Any? other drugs that seem to decrease the efficacy? Like I was reading recently about a study where they, they suggested acetaminophen uh, decrease the efficacy of other, any other drugs like that? Yeah, so that's, um, hi Chad, that's where things are going. We just did, um, one of our resident projects this year is looking at different concomitant medications and its potential effect on metastatic melanoma treatment outcomes with immune checkpoint inhibitors. It's definitely this evolving, this evolving landscape where we're not quite sure, you know, is it scheduled Tylenol? Is it as needed Tylenol? You know, there's more data, harder data for like antibiotics, for example, because we know the microbiome is involved more, but it's all, it's all enough to make you kind of pause now and think about it, um, of what the patient is actually taking at home. But if a patient needs Tylenol, is it really undoing fully what the immune checkpoint inhibitor is doing? We don't know. There's gonna be a ton more coming out on this, I would say in the next five to 10 years. <laughs>